All right, there we go. Okay, so today I'm, uh, I want to get into book four of the Republic. Now, this is probably the core chapter of the book. This is where we get at least our first real answer from Socrates as to what justice is. We're not going to get to that today. We're hopefully going get to get to that Thursday. If we do have class on Thursday, we're actually going to figure out what Socrates thinks justice is in a person or in an individual soul. Um, otherwise, if we don't have class Thursday, then we'll have to wait until after spring break. Sorry. Um, but we're, we're ramping up to it. We're getting to the last little bits of pieces that we have to fit together to understand what justice is going to be like in a city. And then we can take that that allegory and apply it to the individual. So, there was one thing that I didn't talk about last week in book three. And it was a major topic and it took over the last like three, four pages or so. Does anyone know what I might be talking about? And it's very closely related to book four. this particular myth that Socrates proposes for the people in this, this ideal city to learn? What was this? <clears throat> yes, the myth of the metals. So. <clears throat> How did this go? How, uh, how are people supposed to believe? What is this myth supposed to tell people? And I mean explicitly, what is, what is the actual myth, not like what lesson is it supposed to teach? We'll get to that next. Mm -hmm. um, what you're good at is like you're the best on me. How do you mean? Well, that's, the, that's kind of, so you should, you should do what you're the best at, that, and if that's your place in society, that's the lesson that we take away from it. Or at least that's a large part of the lesson we take away from. But what's the what's the actual structure of the myth? How does this go? How does the story go? It's isn't it? It's like the concept of the noble lie. Like it's okay to lie. It's for the good of everyone. Yeah. But what's I mean? Okay. So what is the lie though? What, what are the people in the city learning about themselves that isn't true, but is applicable in some sense? They're learning something from it. What's the myth? Like they're all mixed with a certain amount of like metal, like some people need gold, some people are born with silver in them, and then they have to live accordingly to their metal. Yeah, so everyone is, yeah. Um, so certain people are predisposed naturally for certain kinds of soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so So it's so people are set up as stratified into different into different innate classes. These are supposed to be our innate natures that determine what kind of people we are, what kind of things we're naturally good at, what we're naturally predisposed to do, and therefore what kind of things we should learn to do to accentuate those characteristics and then pass on those characteristics. Okay, so it starts off by saying that there are that we are all um, in a sense, descendants of the same earth, the same land, the same ground. And because of this, we have different amounts of different metals mixed in with our body, mixed in with our blood, with our life blood. Right. Though some people have gold mixed in with them. Some people have silver mixed in with them. Some people have iron or bronze mixed in with them. And this determines different parts of... Uh, our natures, our characteristics. What metal is mixed in with us? So something, one thing to note is that because we're all uh, born of the same earth, we should think of ourselves as, uh, as brothers and sisters, that we're all, uh, in some sense, family, and that if our land is invaded by anyone or if it's threatened by anything, 
then we should leap to its defense, like people defending their family or defending their mother. So that's part of it. That's a small part. But it is part of it. So it's, it's a way of not only connecting people to each other and fitting people into their place in society, but also linking people to this particular community or this particular city. So that's, that's the first part, but that's a minor part. More importantly is what we've been alluding to, is this stratification, this saying some people are gold, some people are silver, some people are iron and bronze. And that these kinds of people are fundamentally different. And that if you have children, you can pass on these characteristics. So if you have children and you're gold and the other parent is also gold, that child is mostly going to be gold. Now, he also notes there might be exceptions. So maybe, um, maybe because there have been so many generations since this began, uh, there have been various mixtures of these metals. And so maybe you and so you and both parents of a child are both gold, and they're both guardians, rulers. And they have a child who's primarily bronze. That's perfectly understandable. And the best thing to do for that child is to raise that child as um, a bronze person. Now, what does that mean? What are these goals? So we have the three categorizations. We have gold. We have silver. Then we have iron and bronze, which are sort of lumped together. Now, um, iron and bronze here, he doesn't specifically note which is which and what distinction there is between them. Um, other scholars have tried to draw out implications of, well, iron people are, are certain kinds of producers and bronze people are other kinds of producers. Although, again, Plato isn't specific and it doesn't matter a lot. So these correspond, each of these corresponds to a social role. And these are social roles that we've looked at already. So gold people are what? What are people who, they're leaders or rulers, or um, what he calls true guardians. These are the people we've been talking about as the subjects of this education system, the kind of people we're raising to be the leaders of our society. Uh, what about our silver people? I like, I like the middle class. In what sense? Well, yes. The no, not merchants. Doctors. No, not doctors either. So just like normal guardians? Yeah. Auxiliary? So the auxiliaries. So these are the other guardians, the ones who actually guard the city. These are the warrior class. So soldiers. What about iron and bronze? Not necessarily. And actually, it's, well, you say peasants. Now, it's actually important that they're not peasants, and we'll get to that in a moment. We'll see why that these are very different from what we might think of as peasants. Craftspeople? Yeah, so craftspeople, traders, in general, producers. Basically producers everyone. or workers. What's that? Basically, everyone else that's not a guardian or a leader. An actual soldier or true guardian. Yeah, so these are the people who make things, who trade things, who produce wealth and produce material prosperity for the city. This is the most substantial basis that the city is built on. Most people are iron and bronze. Now, they aren't peasants. I mean, maybe in a, in a sense of social power or something like that. Okay, sure. <coughs> they don't rule the city. But what do we think of when we think of a peasant? Someone describe a peasant. When you hear the word, what do you think of? Um, well, I think of, um, think of someone like I think of someone who works for works for someone else for very cheap money. Okay. Yeah, so they don't get a lot of they don't get a lot of payment. They're constantly working. They're under the thumb of somebody. Did you have something to add? Oh, I was just gonna say people who are just working the land for they don't own anything in particular. They're just uh, right. doing menial labor. 
labor. It's just labor. Right. So laborers, they work for other people. Um, they could be craftsmen. They could be, yeah. So they can make things. That's true, too. But generally, there's nothing like serfs is maybe synonymous with peasants in most of our minds. Right? And that's a distinction I want to bring out, because the producers and the workers in Plato's um, ideal city, the perfectly just city, are very different from this. And oh, a term that I'm going to throw around that you actually that you read in here before uh, is the Callipolis. Uh, which just means ideal city. Um, it's interchangeable with aristocracy uh, or republic. Uh, republic is just the Latin version of Callipolis, which is the Greek. Um, aristocracy is based on who rules, and we have to wait to get to that. But if he uses any of these three terms, he means the same thing. This particular social structure. I don't want to. I don't want that, that throwing anybody off. But these, so these producers, these workers, they can craft. They can be craftsmen. They can be farmers. They can be producing anything. They can even be tradesmen. So they can. They can be these merchants. They can be doctors. All of these things, with the exception of guardians. <coughs> that they talked about in book two as being necessary for the city when the city was first being built. People who produce things. Material goods and services and whatever. Now, it's also important that these people, the iron and bronze people, are materially the most prosperous and the most wealthy out of everyone in the city. Why? According to, okay, maybe I should ask this first. According to the myth, why? According to the myth of metals, why is it that our iron and bronze blooded people are going to be the ones who are able to have the most wealth in the city and actually going to be able to possess their own things? Well, yeah, without, I mean, I guess without these categories of people, the rulers basically don't have anyone to rule over. Right, so this is, first of all, like I said, they're the basis of society. They're the ones who produce all of the material prosperity. Yeah, something else? Isn't, it, isn't the purpose of the gold and silver classes to like not necessarily appease, but keep the iron and bronze happy, keep the society actually functioning? They do keep the society functioning and keep things working well together. And in a sense, they keep the iron and bronze people happy, but they also keep everyone, else, everyone in the city happy, including themselves, in the appropriate way. And we'll look at that as well, um, because that's that's odd, and that's one of, the, one of the objections that Glaucon brings up, is that these people especially don't seem all that happy, because remember, they can't own any kind of personal property. But according to the myth, right, these people are iron and bronze. These people are made up of iron and bronze. Why are they the only ones allowed to own material wealth? What's the lie that we tell them? The lie that, especially the lie that we tell these people. Anyone remember this? So that's part of it. So these people are already producing things. And they use iron and bronze tools to produce things, especially. So that's part of what makes them um, what makes them effective at what they do is they're using this, this iron and bronze things. But they're using it to acquire what? What are they acquiring by producing this? Money. Money. What, specifically? Gold. What else? What else is valuable? Silver. Gold and silver. Right? These people don't have gold and silver. These people already have gold and silver. These people are told that they already have material wealth inside themselves. Right? Their value is what they can contribute. It's, it is inappropriate for them, according to this myth, to accumulate external goods, to collect gold and silver, because they're already made up of gold and silver. These people don't have gold or silver within them, so it's perfectly acceptable for them to accumulate it. They can have material wealth especially because they're going to be then using it to produce more things for the whole city. 
And that's how they produce more things for the whole city. The gold and silver people don't use material wealth in the same way that the producers do. The auxiliaries and the guardians, or the auxiliaries and the rulers, aren't using material wealth for the prosperity of the city. If they had material wealth, it would sit there, or it would be used for some kind of decadence, used only for personal pleasure. It wouldn't be put to use for the benefit of the city like it would be for the producers. The producers making things and exchanging things, this is going to increase the overall prosperity of the city, which then can be managed by the rulers and guarded by the auxiliaries. Whereas if these people or these people had their own, oh, yeah, question. I was just going to ask, so if you're born as an iron or bronze, are you allowed to break the system and like say, OK, I want to be gold or silver now? No. Excellent question. No seems to be the answer. But it's questionable. Kind of like divergent. <laughs> Excellent example. I've actually had people write about divergent like extensively to do with this in relation to the Republic. Um, that actually can be one of the kind of things that you can write about because there's a lot of a lot of um, modern pop fiction that's and well fiction in general from any time since Plato uh, that relates pretty closely to the topics in here. So that's a good thing to think about to start writing this. But in any case, right, so they they can in a sense they wouldn't. What I mean by that is that remember what we're doing here. We're building the perfectly just city. So remember back to when I was talking a few weeks ago about what I'm good at. Does anyone remember what the example was that I said I'm super bad at? Screenwriting. Screenwriting. Yeah, I'm a bad screenwriter. I would not be a good screenwriter. Um, I would be very bad at it, but maybe I want to. Maybe I want to do that. Maybe I would like to um, to write fiction. But because I would be bad at it, two things go wrong. One, well, what 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 goes wrong if I decide to go be a screenwriter instead of teaching? You're not doing your job. Well, maybe my job becomes screenwriting. That's a little bit question begging. You're not doing what you're good at. Right, but what, what's job bad about that? Like job. Uh, yes, you're correct. So, what, what goes wrong? It's like not helping others. Like, if you were not teaching them something that you were good at, then like, you're kind of like failing your students or something. Yeah, so suppose I'm really good at this. I, I don't want to prejudge this or not, but suppose I'm at least above average uh, as far as teaching. Thanks. <laughs> suppose I'm mm -hmm. pretty good at this. By going and being a, being a bad screenwriter, I'm not helping you to learn. Presumably important things, not presumably. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say you're depriving students of their education. Yeah. I mean, education is something valuable. Yeah. Right? And maybe I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I'm at least OK at it. Certainly, I'm better at this than I would be as a screenwriter. So I should, I should do this. Now, what's the other thing that goes wrong? So I'm, I would be depriving you of an education in some sense, yeah. Someone who would be a better screenwriter wouldn't be able to be? That, too. Well, I mean. Presuming I have any measure of success, <laughs> right? I'd be taking somebody else's job. What else? Also, oh, like it goes back to I think like virtue. Like you're not doing what you your life's supposed to, like your life purpose. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you're wasting your time. Right. You to. I'm wasting my time trying to be a screenwriter. And like because of that, you're not like being just almost. So that's that's actually very correct, right? I'm not being just, and that kind of hints at where we're going with this. But yeah. Well, what if you love to do it? So if you love to be the bad screenwriter, would it still well, be just or not? So, it. so here's one. So if I if I were to go and be a screenwriter and I were to buy a MacBook and I were to go sit in a Starbucks somewhere in LA and uh, write screen and write screenplays, I <laughs> listen. I'm allowed to be mean. Plato didn't like actors and poets, so I'm allowed to I'm allowed to at least say things that are mean to actors and poets in class. Um, right, so I'm, I go to Hollywood. I, I buy a MacBook with my last, my last, whatever, two, three thousand dollars, however much MacBooks are. Um, I sit, I sit there, and I write screenplays, and I try and get them, I try and get them made. Given the talented screenwriting that I have 
I have explained that I don't have. What's going to happen? A lot. How's that going to? Is that going to be fulfilling to me? I should. So, uh, a couple of analogies. For, I, I mentioned I, I based this. I based the structure of this course on a, on a professor I had at Stetson University. And he used a couple of fantastic examples for this. Um, one of which, which really sticks with me. So, um, is so a happy broom. So a broom is one that's sweeping. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's not the broom that wants to go be Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Maybe this is a little bit of a dated reference, but you get the idea, right? It's not the new Miss 2000. Uh, right, so you don't, you don't, we don't, we don't look to the people who have big dreams and fail spectacularly as the happy people in the world. Right? We look to the people who are doing what they love and they're really good at and doing it spectacularly. Those are the people like, yeah, that's kind of how I want to be. Yeah. Can I ask a separate question? Yeah. Um, so you said that their wealth, like gold and silver people's wealth, mm -hmm. is only used for personal pleasure and not contributing anything to mm -hmm. society. Can you like explain this a little further? I don't know. Oh, okay, right. So so um, somebody who makes shoes, to use Plato's favorite example. Mm -hmm. um, they sell a bunch of shoes, they have a bunch of money. What are they doing with it? Um, they buy themselves other things. They buy nice things, but then they also buy materials <coughs> and buy tools and things to make more shoes. They're using their wealth to produce more. So wealth has a has a growing and building effect when it's used by iron and bronze people. Okay, but like when gold and silver people buy themselves shoes, they're also kind of contributing. So, yeah, they're they're paying the shoemaker yeah. and they're contributing to his business. So mm -hmm. this isn't to say that they can't have any material possessions whatsoever. But the only material possessions they have or they need are the things they use to do their jobs. Beyond that, what is a ruler going to do with wealth? Keep uh, hold on to it. Maybe buy things. Buy opulent goods, like we see every ruler in actual history doing. But is that helping them rule? That helping them to be a, a better ruler. Oh, well, I mean, would it be considered the ruler's personal funds? Like, is there a distinction between like, well, well, they don't really have government, do they? Well, they are kind of the government. Now, here, what I mean by that though is, the true guardians here, the rulers, are more like really, really good guidance counselors. Their role in society is to make sure that this, that this structure of society is maintained properly. And doing that is a matter of making sure the education system is working properly, <clears throat> and making sure that people are guided towards the jobs they're most suited to. It's not so much the job of the rulers to, to make sure that, I don't know, make sure that, that people aren't like hurting each other. Maybe that's, an, maybe that's something important that could be done. Excuse me. But that could also be done by a producer, in a sense. Somebody who's producing, call it arbitration services. Okay, so court like, services. Yeah. if you had to arm an army, mm -hmm. who would be in charge of that? Like, would it be upon the producers to create the things of no charge and then just give them to the auxiliaries, or would they, like, have Yes. Okay. More or less, yeah. So part of the part of what they're producing are the requirements of the auxiliaries to defend the city and the requirements of the rulers to rule the city. It's so, also self-managing, really. I mean, yes, hypothetically. Again, though, no. remember, um, Socrates is very upfront about once again that you can't implement this. This would be a disaster immediately. Um, because no, that wouldn't work. So auxiliaries would have to force producers to produce for them, and then that would give auxiliaries more power, and then it would create resentment in the, in the producers, and things would go to shit really quickly. Right. So again, what, what we're doing is we're making a, um, a very hypothetical model of a perfectly just city, which does self-manage. And the reason it self-manages, again, has to do with it being an allegory for the individual soul. So yeah. 
So when, when it talks about we'll, we'll get. people with mixed metals, so if you have someone with bronze and someone with silver, what are, what are they supposed to do? What is their purpose? Whichever they have more of, which is determined primarily by the rulers. That's part of, that's an essential part of what these people are very good at. They determine what everyone else's role is, basically. Yeah, based on what they would be good at, what they're best suited for. Also, oh, can it be applied as far as like gold is gold are the people with the most wealth? No. In fact, they have the least wealth. They have no um, property of their own. In fact, um, as we get forward into, um, into book five especially, um, so this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but you get a hint of it in book four. Uh, the rulers of the city are living in something like military barracks. They're living collectively. They are, uh, their diet is fairly simple. It's what they need to, to uh, maintain good physical fitness and not much more. Um, they don't own anything personal. Uh, anything they own is considered part, it, part of or property of the city because their whole purpose is service to the city. And their, their purpose is to rule the city. Whereas these people can perfectly well accumulate wealth, gold and silver. So they're, in fact, the richest, at least in this ideal setup. They have the most wealth out of everyone. And it's because that accumulation of wealth is in service to the city, in a way, right, indirectly. Whereas if either of these types of people were to accumulate lots of wealth, it would only be for their own benefit. Something else? Yeah, I was just gonna say, like, shouldn't we all be, considering there's been like thousands of generations, mm -hmm. shouldn't we all be like a mixture of all three? Yeah, probably. Um, which is, again, a bit of an issue. Um, Again, this is more of an issue if it's if it's uh, if we take this as a strictly political prescription. If we take this as an allegory, if we take this as the parts of yourself, the parts of your mind, the parts of your soul, then it works out a little better um, because it's pretty clear. It, will, it, it eventually becomes pretty clear what each of these parts mean. And those are relatively more distinct. So there's that first of all. In addition, though, we do eventually develop a system for for breeding the best rulers, breeding the best auxiliaries, and breeding the best uh, workers. Now he's especially concerned um, with breeding the best rulers. So again, getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we'll get to this. There's this, because uh, remember th the idea is that um, people, if two people have a child, then that child is going to be um, some kind of a mix of whatever metals they are. So we take the most gold, the goldest people, right? And we make sure that they have children together so that they produce a more gold child. So ideally, it's getting better and better and better as generations go on. The people are getting more and more suited. Now, it's really hard to do that if people aren't in on it. But on the other hand, if people are in on it, then they're not going to believe the myth and things are gonna fall apart anyway. So again, there's an issue here. Um, so the idea that it comes up with is something like a rigged, <coughs> I mean, I wanted to save this before we got to it, but something like a, an annual rigged sex lottery for the Guardians. Yeah. So this is a, a way of setting up who gets to mate with whom to have the best children. And this was something like roughly annual there'd be a weird guardian mating season thing. It was all determined by whoever determined who would have the best guardian offspring, right? But the point of this is so that we would get more and more gold children in the next generation. Again, this is in book five if you're interested in the, the weird little minutia of it. We are gonna get into it. We're gonna talk about it a little bit. And we're also gonna talk about what the hell this could possibly mean. Um, because remember, it's not just about the city. It's, it's about the solar, it's about the mind. Seems weird. It does seem weird. But it makes sense, I think. Does that mostly answer your question? Does it help answer it? It does. I just like I just can't see like how this relates to an individual, but like I'll probably understand it. We'll get there uh, hopefully by the end of class, though at least hinting at it. Then we'll really pick it up on Thursday and we'll get we'll really develop what this goal <coughs> looks like based on this model. <laughs> Okay, so any other questions on the, on the basic structure 
of what the what each class does and the structure of society and how the society fits together. Okay, cool. Now, the middle part of book four. You already talked a little bit about what each of them are going to be doing. Uh, and then he moves on to ask the the probably most crucial question of where are each of the virtues in this city? How do we say that this city is wise, courageous, moderate or temperate, and just? So he goes to ask, where is wisdom in this city? What about this structure makes this city wise? Real question. Yeah, right. so wisdom goes here. Why is that? Um, because after all their training, there's been tests that they have done that they don't. It's all of their training, so therefore they're the best fit rulers. Yeah, so they have the particular education that makes them most fit to be rulers, which also makes them the most wise. But why is it that these rulers, now going further, why is it that these rulers make the city as a whole wise? Uh, actually, I'll just I'll ask oh, sure. you to clarify or sure. that, uh, your first question. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Uh, like, uh, I was just asking if you can repeat it. Uh, oh, so, so what about the wisdom of the rulers in particular okay. makes the city as a whole wise? They have both the um, practical and theoretical wisdom? They do. That's a big part of it, right? So they have theoretical wisdom. They have this knowledge of abstract truths, which they train independently, which again, which we'll, we'll look more particularly at in book six, as to what that looks like and what that training will look like. And this is where we get into that stage of like 30 plus years of geometry. And they also have practical wisdom, how to get things done. So they're, in addition to, to contemplating abstract truths, they also know how to organize the city towards particular ends or particular goals. And that's the key, right? So it's this, it's this combination of knowing abstract truths, which we think of as, as wisdom in general, Sophia or, abst or uh, theoretical wisdom, <coughs> and this applied or practical wisdom, this phronesis. What about this combination makes the city as a whole just? They're able to or sorry, what makes the city as a whole wise, not just? Yeah, they're, they're able to be examples. So they're able to, to lead their example and show this is what a just person looks like. This is how you should act. True. So that's something that, that was mentioned that they need in the city. That's true. That is very true. There's more to it. There's a bit more to it. What did I say was the primary thing that they're keeping organized in the city? So, the education. The education, right? So these, the, the, the wisest people in the city are responsible for the education of the whole city. Right? They're the ones directing everyone to their proper, proper role, proper function. They're providing the wisdom of the city as a whole. So the auxiliaries and the producers are wise insofar as they listen to the guardians or the rulers. The guardians or the rulers figure out what everyone's place is going to be. The auxiliaries and the workers will fit into that place because they recognize that these are the wise people, they know what's best. Now there's, of course, lots of, clearly, lots of problems with this. Question? There's clearly lots of problems with this, right? Um, Issues of distributed knowledge and, and one group of people knowing what's best for everyone. Um, this is especially an issue once the city gets too large, which is part of why Plato is insistent that the city stay a fairly small size. And part of why the, he's talking about a city, not like a country as well. That's also important. But the idea, though, is that the, the wise guardians, or the rulers, are providing the wisdom of the city as a whole. They're directing the entire city towards doing what each part ought to do and how each part ought to do it well. Now, the rest of them can have practical wisdom, how to fulfill their roles <coughs> properly. They don't need to figure out for themselves what their role is, and they don't need to figure out for themselves broad abstract truths. 
because they can be taught that. So in a sense, a, a, a theoretically wise worker or a theoretically wise auxiliary is superfluous. They don't need it. They don't need that kind of theoretical wisdom right, in this context. And in some cases, if they are somewhat theoretically wise, and they get this idea in their head that they are very theoretically wise, but they're still not as wise as the rulers, that can be a problem because then they can attempt to, they can think they can and then attempt to supersede the judgments of the rulers. Maybe I think I am a super good screenwriter, right? Well, no, I know better. I have at least some degree of wisdom to know that that's not my proper role, but to say I did. I would be thinking I was more wise than people who have told me, don't do that. You're really bad at writing fiction. Okay. So what about courage, our next virtue? Where is courage in the city? Silver? Yeah. Can you also say spirited instead of courage? Yes. So courage belongs to the spirited part, which now we're jumping ahead a little. What did he say? Spirited. Oh. We'll get to that. <coughs> because that's where courage is in the individual, is in the spirited part. And the, the auxiliaries are the most spirited people in the city. And we'll get to how that applies to the individual, because then it, it really does. So like I know we're not trying to jump ahead, but like so like, is wisdom like the the mind, and then courage is like the soul or spirit. And then... Almost, you're almost almost right. okay. So wisdom belongs to the mind or reason. Courage belongs to the spirit. Okay. I'll let you see. <laughs> yeah. So well, little preview. The rulers represent reason, wisdom in the or reason or the mind in the individual. Auxiliaries represent the spirit uh, or passion in the individual. And these represent something else we'll get to. Okay, so how are our silver people, how are our silver people the most courageous? What does that mean to be, for them they to be courageous? They fight for their city. They fight for their city. In what way? In, uh, in what makes their fighting courageous? Like Mm -hmm. So they're not afraid of death, like we talked about a lot. Right? So being afraid of death will, will detract from this courageous fighting for your city. So I also going to say that um, you're willing to sacrifice your lives in order to protect the mm -hmm. citizens living in the city. So they will fight even in the face of extreme danger. <coughs> and they'll sacrifice themselves for the city as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's important as well. They will, the most important thing here is they will do what is right in the face of danger or in the face of threat. That's what's essential here to courage. And that's, what, well, that's what the auxiliaries are supposed to be best at. They're supposed to be able to do the right thing, do, in this case, what the guardians will command, which is what's best for the city, even if it's dangerous to them. Hmm? When you're saying like the courage is found in the most spirited people, is their spirit the sense of like the city-wide spirit? Of like their dedication? Both. Or well, in general? Both. Both. Okay. So they they represent sort of the spirit of the city. Mm -hmm. They're the part that goes out and defends the city's safety and honor and everything. So they're like the spirit of the city. And then individually they're also very spirited people. They're they're very um, passionate, they're very able to to rouse up their passions and defend themselves and their city and that kind of thing. And that's based on a sense of a sense of community, a sense of patriotism, mm -hmm. a sense of honor, all these things. Okay, good question. Okay, questions. Well, okay, actually. So what? Well, I kind of just I kind of just gave this away. But what makes the courage of the auxiliaries? What about that makes the city as a whole courageous? So they do what's right, but then... I would say that maybe, um, uh, maybe them seeing them um, being uh, courageous and maybe fighting for them, 
while there's others driving from the city as a whole, they can um, back them up when, when needed. Yeah, so it makes, so these people being courageous makes, for one, the producers more spirited when appropriate. They're more, in a sense we can say patriotic, they have more of a sense of this is our community and we have to work together to defend it. Okay. And so they're going to do that in their own way. And also it's going to make the rulers more courageous because the rulers are going to, to properly command the soldiers to do the right thing, even if it's dangerous, right? So if you know, if, suppose you're sort of a commander of soldiers and you know that your troops are very courageous, they're going to, they're going to go and get the thing done. And they're going to do the right thing you're more likely to, to command them to do something dangerous that you know needs to be done if you know they're gonna carry through with it than if you think, well, these people might run away. So courageous auxiliaries are going to make both the rulers and the producers more courageous. What else? What about, what about their courage makes the city considered as a, as a unit or as a whole? What makes the city courageous? They preserve its beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's crucial. So they preserve the city's beliefs, they preserve the city's unity, they preserve the city's safety, uh, its wealth, such as it is. Again, the city isn't going to be like fabulously wealthy. All of the wealth is going to be these people and not the rulers. But even still, they're not going to be losing people, losing goods, losing land going to keep the city whole and together. So the city is going to fight off threats rather than capitulate to them. And it's going to use the auxiliaries to do that. But having a good and courageous set of auxiliaries is going to make the city as a whole more capable of fighting off threats. And it's going to make the city as a whole more capable of keeping itself intact keeping, like you said, keeping its beliefs intact and not faltering. So that the whole city is made courageous in this way. Right? So the whole city, the city as a unit, is courageous because, because due to these courageous auxiliaries, the city is able to fight off threats properly. Fight off the appropriate threats in the appropriate way. Questions so far on either of these? Because these are the easy ones. All right, cool. Moderation or temperance. Where is moderation or temperance in the city? Isn't it in both? The, the iron and in gold? Yeah. Was anyone about to say it's in the iron and bronze? Be honest. Because that's the easy answer, but it's not quite right. You're right. So it's in both. Yeah, moderation, or the other word is temperance. Okay. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this translation uses them both kind of interchangeably. It talks about both. Mm -hmm. So they're just in uh, gold and bronze, not silver. The sil right, so the silver aren't necessary for moderation, strictly speaking. Now, you could make an argument that they are, that they are required for moderation in an indirect sense. By, um, by carrying out and implementing the commands of the rulers, um, the commands of the guardians, they're, uh, they're encouraging the producers to be moderate. Something like that, but only indirectly. Only indirectly. It's primarily in the iron bronze people, the producers, and in the gold rulers. So what is it? What is moderation? such that it's sort of distributed here, yeah. Well, if someone who belongs to the iron and bronze class is too wealthy, they won't pay as much attention to their work, and if they're too poor, they also won't pay very, well, very good attention to their work, so their work wouldn't be done as well. Mm -hmm. So, that's another problem. So that's true, but that seems like it's only for the producers. So the producers, yes, you're right, they should be, they should be finding this moderate or temperate mean 
between excessive wealth and excessive poverty. And so should the city as a whole. Right? And so the city as a whole should be having this, this moderation of this temperance between wealth and poverty, between excess and deficiency. And because the iron and bronze people are the primary property owners, they're going to be, at least in an immediate sense, they're going to be primarily responsible for it. But how does this involve the rulers? Isn't there a responsibility to apply their wisdom to help moderate it? In part. But that seems like that seems a bit indirect. It is a bit indirect. So there's another element to moderation here. Isn't it that the iron and bronze people would need to have the ability to recognize the the gold people are the leaders, as the, the more suited people do the job, so they let them do the job in a sense? Yes. So something to add? <clears throat> okay. Um, the, I mean, there's, there's of course, always more to add, so if there's, there's something else, feel, feel free to jump in. But. So that's exactly right, though. Right. So, so the iron and bronze people are moderate in a sense that they know who should rule, and they allow those rulers to rule. The gold people, know who should rule, and they know who should produce and have wealth. And they allow those people to produce and to have wealth. So moderation in these people is primarily allowing these people to rule. Moderation in these people is allowing these people to have the wealth in the city. So in both cases, it's a, it's a case of recognizing who ought to have what, and allowing them to have it, and not interfering. So moderation or temperance in this case is something like minding your own business. And not interfering with what other people are trying to do, or what other people ought to be doing. They know that, so the gold people, the rulers, know that they're the ones most suited to ruling, and so they do it. And they know that the iron and bronze people are most suited to producing and most suited to owning wealth, so they let them do that. They let them produce and they let them own their own wealth, and they don't try and gather wealth from them, they don't try and produce for them. So, now? so in line, so in line, you're saying that, um, like that people in the gold wall have no interaction with people in the bronze. Um, um, no, no, they, they'll still interact, right? Because they're they're all people of the same city. But you find they just won't tell them like how to do things. Right. Okay. So the rulers aren't going to be telling the shoemaker that your, the soles need to be thicker, right? No. The, if you get if you're a ruler and and the cobbler makes you a pair of shoes, trust that he did a good job because he did because he's a cobbler and you're not, right? I, yes, he knows that you're going to be going on uh, going on on campaign somewhere that it's going to be snowing or something. <clears throat> and he planned for that. He knows that the material of the soles of your shoes are thick enough. And if you're going to say, "Hey, wait, hold on, I'm uh, I'm going I'm going up I'm going somewhere snowy this winter. You really should. Uh, would you mind like making my shoes a bit thicker?" What's the cobbler going to say? No, he's going to say, uh, all due respect, Mr. Ruler, no, you're wrong. I know how to make shoes. You know how to rule, so I'll obey your commands about ruling the city and about structuring the city. You let me make you shoes. That's moderation. So in that case, a ruler who asks the shoemaker, hey, make my shoes a bit thicker, is being immoderate. Do they like, see wealth as like their skill? Instead of like money, you know For what I'm saying? Whom? Like who in, in the society, money? like like they see like their stance as like their wealth, like like gold because they're gold. They see themselves because they're gold. That's their wealth, and that's the why they respect. That's what like I see like respect back in each situation. Yeah, it's something like that, especially in the case of the rulers. Yeah. Now, in the case of the in the case of the producers, they can also, in addition to their wealth being in their skill. Their skill is more like a tool, and their wealth is you know, wealth, actual wealth. Right, so uh, that's in part why he uses the analogy of bronze and iron, because bronze and iron were, were tools. They were for tools, primarily. 
Um, so people used bronze and iron's tools to create things. So the workers used their skills to create things. Whereas the rulers and even the auxiliary students sense, their wealth is, like you said, in their skill. Yeah. But I was also like kind of thinking about like the reason why I think it's so successful is because the absence of greed, like they just like mind your own business, like they kind of like moderation is key to that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Is the moderation for like the iron and bronze? sort of regulated in the sense of like, in order for that to change, it depends on the people like buying their goods and stuff like that? True. Is that kind of like another yeah, part so of it? Yeah, so in, in a sense it gives the whole city uh, moderation in that these people depending on both each other yeah. and the other classes to, to purchase their goods. So if the producers, well, if everyone is moderate, Mm. then the whole city is going to be moderate because it's not going to be producing excessively and it's or not going to be, yeah, it's not going to be producing excessively, mm. not going to be buying excessively, not going to become excessively rich or excessively mm. poor, not going to expand excessively or, con or contract mm. the, um, excessively. Going to stay at approximately the right size, approximately the right wealth, and approximately the same, the correct structure. Mm. The structure of the city is going to be maintained. These people aren't going to produce or consume to excess. Mm -hmm. So yes. So it's this moderation of these two, especially interacting with one another, interacting in this way, allowing each other to do the thing that they are that is appropriate to them. But that's the moderation of the city. Each part allows the other parts to do their job and understands that. So uh, uh, iron and bronze people understand that silver people are the appropriate auxiliaries, are the ones who are best suited to defend the city. So they allow them to defend the city. They understand that the gold people are the ones best suited to ruling, and so they allow them to rule. Meanwhile, uh, the people here understand that the iron and bronze people are the ones most suited to production. They're most suited to making things, to trading, to producing things for the city, and so they let them do it. So we don't want to get in, we don't want to get into our minds and say yes, rulers are are dictating how things are done on a production level because they don't know. Uh, they're not expert craftspeople. They're not even expert. Well, they're especially not say expert managers of wealth. That's what these people are good at. And so good moderate rulers will allow them to produce and allow them to have their wealth in their way, in a, pro in a way that's appropriate to their social standing, in a way that's appropriate to their, even their, uh, their makeup or their nature. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, like, I, this could be wrong, but like, technically, there's no difference between iron <coughs> and gold, except that gold is rare. What do you mean? Like, what makes gold, like, rulers, like, why? Oh, so why are rulers Each gold? Metal, like, correspond to oh, um, it's mostly cultural, but in part it's what they're typically used for. Okay. Uh, so gold is the rarest metal. It, it's generally seen socially as very precious. It's also very, it's also very um, malleable or adaptable. And the rulers have to be able to adapt to things. Uh, silver is, is considered a metal of purity, especially in ancient Greek culture. All right, so it doesn't accept changes to itself. So if you have something with silver, it, it, even if it tarnishes, you can wipe it off. Um, whereas if something iron or bronze tarnishes, you can't repolish it. It, it rusts, or it, or it, like bronze, um, will turn different colors and things. So silver uh, prevents something like infection or something like that. Mm -hmm. Iron and bronze were. Uh, the most, the hardest, the most durable metals they had access to, so they were used for tools and things. Okay. So they they were used in production. So this is that's roughly why they were equivalent. But it's also pretty arbitrary, right? The reason for it is more so to divide people along these class lines. So thinking of them in terms of silver people or gold people or iron people is more a way of thinking of uh, thinking of thinking of the people as their social role. So silver people really winds up just being a shorthand for auxiliaries. So people who guard the city. 
Uh, thinking of gold people is just a sh sort of a shorthand for thinking of them as rulers of the city, etc. So you're right, it is, it is <coughs> arbitrary. Questions on, on moderation before we get to justice? Okay, where is justice? Throughout. So, yeah. Justice is throughout the whole city. How so? What is just about everyone in the city? That everything is working independently of each other, that no one kind of does what you're not supposed to do. Well, that's moderation. So this independence and no one interfering with one another, that's moderation. We don't want people interfering with other people's work. Justice is slightly different. Maybe I'll put it this way, maybe somebody can expand, expand on this. So rather than independence of each other's work, which is what moderation encourages, justice seeks for interdependence. Who let me in there? And the entire system depends on everyone else. So like the bronze people depend on silver, who depend on the gold, who depend on silver, who depend on bronze. Yeah, so the entire city depends on one another. And so moderation means don't interfere with what other people are doing. Justice is depend on what other people are doing. But what does that mean for the individual? Oh, yeah. Everything works together in harmony. Right? <laughs> so in addition to people not interfering, you're working together for a common purpose. So yeah, what else? And they're all working on the tasks that they're best suited for, and they all know what they should know, they all know how they should act. Mm -hmm. Everyone's good at their job, and everyone does their job. Right. So if we're going to put it in maybe, maybe some, um, I don't know, hippie language, um, justice is everyone working together in harmony working harmoniously. So everyone doing their particular task and doing it well. And doing their particular task for the service of the people, in service of the people around them, and in service of the city as a whole. <clears throat> so one way, of, one way of sort of illustrating this that I've always found helpful is thinking of the city as something like a pyramid is divided into three parts. So the bottom part, the part that everything is based on, right? without this the whole thing crumbles, uh, is the producers. Right? So this is the part that everything is built on top of. And it's also the largest part of this pyramid metaphor. And on top of that, you have the auxiliaries, which serve as something like intermediaries between the two, two other parts, and then also serve as the most, um, the most structural part. So this, this middle part is what holds everything together and prevents things from, from damaging it from outside. Right? So this is the, these are the defenses of the city, so to speak keeping the city together and whole. And then on top, you have the rulers or guardians, which are like the capstone. There's only a few of them, and they provide the wisdom of the city. They guide the city as a whole. And they keep everything doing its proper role. So wisdom, like we said, is found up in the capstone. So wisdom tells everything its part, so the, the structure of the pyramid is, this is a terrible drawing, I apologize, but the structure of the pyramid is determined by the shape of the top. Right? So if I were to draw, suppose this were slightly better, if I did that, you can tell how, you can tell by just this angle what the overall shape of a, say, a triangle I'm going to draw from it is. You can tell by the capstone of, say, a pyramid what the shape of the whole thing is going to be like. Now, its size might be different depending on what other things are there. But it's this capstone that determines the overall shape, right? So the, the wisdom of the rulers who are at the top of society in this sense, right? they're, the, they're the, the formative element of society. That wisdom is going to decide what shape society takes. 
So, then stepping down, you have the courage of the auxiliaries, which this is what protects the city from outside threats and keeps the city in this proper shape. So this is what adds to, this is what adds the structural stability to this whole city. This is what keeps the whole thing together and keeps outside things from damaging it. So it keeps the city together and it keeps the city protected. And the producers are the basis, they're the solid base. And they play a part in moderation. They don't want to be on the top, and the people at the top want these people to continue doing their jobs properly. Right? Everyone wants, so moderation is everyone wanting each, say, brick of the pyramid to be in its correct place. Because if things start shifting around and moving around to different places, they're not going to be working properly. The producers are doing what they're best at, and the guardians are doing what they're best at. And still, the auxiliaries are doing what they're best at. And everyone is allowing the others to do their proper job. They're not interfering. They're not getting in the way of each other. And then justice is the whole thing. <clears throat> justice is each piece doing its part properly. Each piece doing its part properly and then being all oriented towards the same structure, right? being each of them a part of the overall structure. That's part. Of, that's the main piece of what justice is. Justice is playing your particular part well as your particular part. So we can even take this back to Epictetus. I don't remember what I thought you were referring to. Way back. What does Epictetus have to say about playing your part? You should um, adjust your expectations and desires to what you're best suited for. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So he gives the example of, uh, of, be, of playing a part in a play. So you can think of it as playing a part in a play. You can think of it as playing a part in uh, an orchestra as a great example to go with a, a sort of platonic, platonic musical theme. I prefer that one. I'm a little more familiar with music than, than theater. So I'll go with, uh, so suppose I'm, uh, suppose I'm um, an oboe player, uh, which I was once upon a time. Um, suppose, while being an oboe player, I decide that I want to play loudly so everyone can hear me. And instead of the oboe part, because it's kind of boring, I want to play the, I want to play the lead trumpet part. How's the orchestra going to sound? They're not going to sound very happy. From experience, you're correct. Um, it, it, things are going to start going wrong, especially if I'm not the only one doing this. If everybody is playing whatever part they want, and if everyone is playing whatever instrument they happen to pick up that day rather than what they're best at, what they're trained at. And they're doing it any way they please rather than doing it with an eye towards well, the piece of music as a whole. So another way of thinking about this is if, if everyone's reading off a different score of music, you're not going to be playing a song. There's just going to be a bunch of different noises happening that don't fit. They don't, they don't fit together into one piece of music. Just like if everyone is thinking they're part of a different building, the building is there's not going to be a building. There's going to be a bunch of rubble. So not only should each part, so for moderation's sake, so not only should each part not interfere with the other parts, so they allow them to do their job well, but then also they should play their role correctly because other parts are depending on that part doing its job right. So other people are depending on you doing your job well. So in that sense, it would be, this is why we kind of noted on this, it would be unjust of me to go try and be a screenwriter. Because not only am I being unjust to myself, right? I'm not doing what I would be best at doing, but further, I would be, one, depriving you of, well, depriving you of this particular education at least. Now maybe, maybe I can be replaced. Like, well, no, not maybe. I can be replaced. I'm aware of that. 
but I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. Suppose, rather than, rather than supposing I had chosen a different career path, just in general, suppose I decide, like, this afternoon, I'm just leaving and going to do, I'm going to go do my thing and be a screenwriter. That would clearly be unjust to all of you. And then further, that would not only disrupt your lives, but it would disrupt the people's lives who depend on you and depend on your education. And this whole thing splinters off. It's like a crack in the windshield that just spider cracks out. So justice is primarily concerned with the harmony of society as a whole and the interdependence of all of the individual pieces and each piece doing its role, doing its job properly. And doing its job towards the common end of the whole. This brings up as another example, so this is uh, something that Plato brings up early, early in this chapter, in book four. Remember how he talks about uh, painting the statue? If you're painting a statue, that the eyes are the most beautiful part of the statue. So why are you painting them black? Why aren't you painting them bright purple? Why aren't you painting them a bright, vibrant color? They attract more work in the world. What's that? They attract your attention when you immediately go to the eyes instead of their being the work in its entirety. Yeah, they're not part of the work, right? They don't look like eyes anymore. So like, if, if the rulers are fabulously wealthy, they are opulent. They are dressed nicely. They are covered in gold. They're not going to be ruling properly. They're just going to be shiny. Right? Maybe they'll look big and important, and maybe they'll be super duper happy about it, but the city as a whole is now without good rulers. And so the city is going to suffer. It's unjust on the whole, right? Quickly, last, well, first of all, questions. I'm unclear what the structure is. Okay. Uh, all right. What parts of the soul do each of these correspond to? What do the guardians correspond to? The rulers. I got a bunch of different answers. Right? Hands. Hands. <coughs> what part? The right now. Rational part. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Fine. They get to be purple. Despite Plato's warning against purple. Reason or the rational part. So the guardians correspond to the reason. The reason of the individual soul. Okay, what about the silver people? What about the auxiliaries? What do they correspond to? Spirited. Art or passion. Oh, should have used a different color. Here. Trying to be consistent. There we go. All right, what about our producers? What do our producers represent in the soul? Is that like the appetite? Yes. Appetite or desire? Oh, come on, really? Every time I try and do this, they run out of ink on some color. Every year. This is super consistent. It's incredibly annoying. Anyway, okay, so the Spirited part is equivalent to the auxiliaries because it plays a similar role in the individual that the auxiliaries play in the soul as a, as a whole. Same with the reason. So the reason in the individual or in the individual soul plays the same role in that individual soul <coughs> that the guardians or the rulers play in the city. Similarly, the appetites or the desires play the same role in the individual that the producers play in, uh, in the city as a whole. So, so this is what's that? Sorry, so it's all interdependent. So each part of the soul depends on each other part of the soul, and it depends on it doing its job properly. And that's a just soul. Now, 
we'll look at this more precisely as we go forward. We've only got five minutes left. It's not enough time to go into each part here. But we can look and we can see how there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between each part of the city and each part of the soul. So now we can look at everything that Plato has said about guardians, about his true guardians, about the rulers of the city. And we can say, okay, that has to apply to human reason, to individual reason. We can look at each part that he's talked about for the spirit, the spirited guardians or the auxiliaries, the soldiers. And we can say that that has to apply to the spirited part of the soul or the passions. And we can look at each individual element that he's ascribed to uh, the producers or the workers in the city. And we can say that has to apply to the desires or the appetites in the soul. So next time we're going to look at what these all mean, how they all fit together, how they all interact to make the soul, the individual soul, just. Because remember, that's what we're trying to figure out. And now you can hopefully kind of see why we put all of this together, why we spend so much time constructing. All right, with that, so let's get back to uh, before. So last time we talked about, we finally put together this, this structure of the ideal city, of the Calipolis. And we had this. Um, metaphorical pyramid structure, something like that. And this perfect city is divided into three parts. And it's called Calipolis. What were the three parts? Silver and bronze. That was the myth, the mythological version. So what? The guardian. Yeah. And then. Um, so the true guardians. soldiers, you can call it producers, workers, they're roughly interchangeable. Um, but these are the three social <coughs> classes, and these are, these are the three major roles within our ideal city. Okay. Let's go from the bottom up. What do the producers provide for the city? Wealth. Wealth. Material goods. Moderation. They help with moderation. Not exclusively, but they help, they, they're a significant part of what contributes to moderation in the city. Workers? Well, they are workers, so they work, they make things. They increase the material wealth of the city, right? They contribute to the material well-being. They, in other words, they fulfill material needs. And wants. Remember. Because there are two kinds of workers. Uh, this distinction goes all the way back to book two when we were looking at um, how Socrates starts building this city, this ascetic version of the city that just has the bare needs, the things people need to survive and to live without any luxuries. And then Glaucon adds more workers, more people to make luxury goods. So both of those are included here in this bottom tier, this, this, producer, this producer part of the city. So there are people producing needs, there are, so there's people producing food, tools, clothing, etc. And then there's also people producing uh, luxury goods, so uh, fine foods, um, luxury housing, right? so nice houses and furniture and such, um, actors, uh, poets, singers, so performers in general, people producing things people want but don't need. That is included here. So what about the auxiliaries? What do they provide for the city? Protection. And threats. So they defend the city from, from external threats, and they enforce the structure of the city, so they prevent any internal threats. Right? Um, they are military and police, so to speak. So we have the producers, the people who make 
or provide for the material needs of the city. No? I'm just a little sign of the trees. Is that trees? I did. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't. Yeah. Well, we don't want uh, our we don't want our um, our city to be a moderate. And they are the courageous stomach. They are the they're the chest, not the stomach. They're the stomach. So uh, let's be careful here. Um, if we're going from Lewis's metaphor, right? These are the stomach. The, 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 the producers provide for the you know, material needs like food. Food's a big one. Um, but easy on the treats. Actually, oddly enough, um, remember we were talking, we were just talking about moderation, moderation in the city. Um, the one of these classes that is least involved in moderation, in providing for the, cities, the city being moderate, is the auxiliaries. So they're not the ones protecting the city from treats. <laughs> That was a, that was a, that was a uh, that was a fortuitous typo there. Um, it's really the guardians and the producers sort of working together, like understanding what everyone's role is and what is appropriate for that role, that um, that produces moderation in the city, right? that, that prevents them from overindulging or underindulging. And such. Okay, so they do. They protect from threats, though. So these can be. Uh, especially external threats, so if something is threatening the city, so if another city is threatening, these people go out and defend the city. Also, if there is some kind of like a revolutionary element, something like that, then they are going to be the ones who are going to say, no, this is, this, you, no, you can't overthrow the Guardians. Something like that. Of course, this being a, a, a very hypothetical and very perfect city, we're less concerned about that. We're less concerned about um, internal threats than external threats. Because internal threats would be minimal as long as this education system we've developed is, is properly implemented and properly maintained. People will be satisfied with their position because their position is what will bring that kind of person the most satisfaction with life. These people get to make things. These people get to do what they're best at. And they get to accumulate wealth. These people get to be honorable. They get to have this proper reputation for honor and justice and all of it, uh, and protect the city. And these people get to do what's right and know what the right thing is to do. They get to be wise. OK, so what is it that the guardians provide for the city? Leaders and rulers. Leaders, rulers. Not, in, not necessarily in the conventional sense, right? So we don't mean that they're something like dictators we would think of. I used the analogy last time that they're like really wise guidance counselors. Right? The idea is they are, they are providing order and structure for the city. So what they're providing, rather than maybe we should say leaders and rulers, they provide structure and organization. Now you can call that leadership, you can call that rulership, whatever you want to call it. But this is the important part about it, is that they are, they're the ones that are making the city be the way that it ought to be. Yeah? So are they, they say like, this is why we should do this thing right? Like they mm -hmm. say that, like they give advice mm -hmm. to, what, to do what's right? Yes. Okay. Um, now, Plato doesn't talk about, I, said, I guess I should say, Socrates doesn't really talk about how this is enforced here. Oh. Um, that's not really his concern at this point. Um, it becomes his concern later when he talks about how a perfect city would degrade and how it would fall apart. But for now, he's not too concerned. He's really thinking about, right, what are they going to do? They are going to provide structure. They're going to say to the producers, hey, you're suited for producing this, and you'll be most happy doing it. And the producer, being a good producer, being a good person, will say, I agree. I do that. So what he's talking about here is the ideal organization, not practicality. Now this could be a problem because well, you need at least some measure of practicality if you're going to set anything up. Right? You have to understand that there's going to be some kinds of imperfections somewhere. 
Part of the answer to that is what I've said all along, that, again, the point isn't the city. Right? The point isn't the political structure. The point is the allegory that we touched on a little bit. We're going to expand more on today. Part of it is also that Plato doesn't think that anything perfect can ever be instantiated. That doesn't, but that doesn't mean it isn't perfect. So I've, used, I've used this example uh, briefly before. Um, What was that? Is it? Not a perfect Right. It's a flawed circle. It's almost a circle. It's a bit of an oblong circle. It doesn't quite close right. Right. How about um, ignore the uh, text over it? What? No. I don't want it to know my location. OK, there. How about that one? How's that one? Are you sure? How sure are we here? All right, let's. Uh, oh, geez. <laughs> there we go. All right, so. See that? Right for the G, the Guardians are at any point here. See how this is angled? There are angles here. Circles don't have angles. This is a regular, I don't know, 10,000 sided figure. Also, the line that is the circle has width. Lines don't have width, geometrically speaking. Right? The point is, right, that anything, even a perfect circle, will be imperfect because it's a particular one. It's this circle. It won't be a a perfect circle, no matter how well you draw it. But that doesn't mean that we can't know what circles are, even in abstract geometric theory. We'll get more into this um, in the next book, after spring break, once we're looking at um, the, the particular education system for the guardians, the ongoing education system for the guardians. Um, and, and this will relate somewhat to why Plato thinks that they need to spend so much time studying arithmetic, studying geometry, um, and then even further studying ethics right, as a separate field. They all relate to this idea that, yeah, just because something in particular can never be perfect, right? This is weird, oblong, not quite perfect. And there's a lot wrong with this circle. That doesn't mean that we can't know different geometric formulas about circles. We can't know things about what would be the perfect circle. Similarly, just because you can't have a perfect city in reality, or anything like reality, it doesn't mean we can't say, OK, what would the perfect city be like? It would be like this, according to Plato. So it's these structures that make a city a perfectly just city. Just like um, adhering to uh, various geometric ratios are what make a circle a perfect circle, even if you can never find one in principle. Okay. So let's move slightly forward. Where are the virtues? Where are the four cardinal virtues? Yeah, but where? Where is each virtue located? We talked about this last time. Oh, like the guardian of the mind, the objects, the soul. Well, they're equivalent to the mind and the soul in the city. But what? What are so? What are the first of all? Question: What are the four cardinal virtues? What are the four virtues we're talking about? Um, is it wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice? Yeah, wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. Um, these are. Uh, they were referred to as the cardinal virtues, like the cardinal directions on compass. Um, there are these major four under which all of the other goods and virtues that we might think of will sort of fit. Right? Um, as an example, Plato talks about piety as a virtue. But he talks about it as a subset, a part of justice right? in certain contexts and with respect to certain things. Um, just like practical wisdom is a subset of wisdom. It's part of wisdom, but it's not wisdom as such. But these are the big 
four. These are the main ones. And if we find each one of these, then we can figure out all the rest of the good things about the city or good things about the soul. So where were each of them? Where's wisdom? Um, rooms. Mm -hmm. So wisdom's here. I'm going to use different colors. Wisdom is in the rulers, because the rulers know what's best, not only in the abstract, but what's best for the city, and what's best for the individual parts of the city. So they give the whole city wisdom. Okay, what about courage? Next one. Auxiliaries. Yep. So the auxiliaries are where we find the courage of the city, because they provide for the defense of the city, right? They, they, they're the ones responsible for the city doing the right thing in the face of danger. This comes back to one, courage in battle, and two, um, being able to follow the orders of the guardians. Right? So being able to do the right thing, even if it's hard. Question? Can you just like, give an example of an auxiliary? Um, so a soldier, basically. So um, these are the people who are, who are on the ground actually fighting in wars. Um, the, the people who are who train specifically for battle, remember, because everybody has a particular specific job in the city. They don't, they don't have, like, like historical Athens, it wasn't that the farmers and craftspeople took up weapons in the summer and went to war. No, these were full-time soldiers, people dedicated to protecting the city. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... What about moderation? Both in the true guardians and the producers. So moderation is between these two. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Like, <laughs> suppose someone who is an auxiliary becomes old, and now they're not fighting anymore and they're just a, a common citizen, does that mean they're still silver, or do, are they bronze now? Hmm. So at this point, I, so I'll give you the straightforward platonic answer, and then I'll move on to speculate a little bit, see if we can figure it out. Um, it doesn't seem like Plato is accounting for aging people here. He doesn't really consider it at this point. The only time he talks about people aging and getting too old to do something, or someone's age affecting how they're going to do something is later on, um, and only with respect to the true guardians. Now, we can ask that question, and I think we would have to say they would still be silver, they would still be auxiliaries, although they would have to serve that function in a different way. Right? So maybe they, they graduate to a command. Right? So they command soldiers, um, or they train new soldiers, or something Excuse me, something maybe less physically rigorous, something they're still capable, um, or uh, relatively capable of doing. Right. Um, but still for the same goal or with, within the same general um, part of the city. Right. Because then you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily have soldiers moving on to become craftsmen, or soldiers even moving on to become guardians, mm -hmm. because then they would have been all along. If that's what they would have been best at, then they should have been doing that from the start. And they haven't been learning the skills needed for it. Right, so the, the ex-soldier who goes on to, to um, become a shoemaker has to learn to make shoes from start at age 60. Right? That is, that's very inefficient. Right? He knows how to wage war already. And he knows how to train other soldiers because he's been trained, he's been alongside training, etc. So that seems like a better fit for him. Moderation here right, is each part, especially the rulers and the producers, knowing who is best suited for what. In other words, this is uh, in the case of the producers, it's them knowing that the rulers are best equipped to rule, best equipped to organize the city and make decisions for the city. And it's rulers knowing that the producers have their proper role and to allow them to do it. And so, if you want to put it simply, um, maybe in 
at the risk of being too uh, too much of putting it in too too political of terms, right? moderation is the producers not revolting, and moderation is the guardians not becoming oppressive. Right? It's not trying to usurp each other's roles, not trying to control what the other's doing. And the same will go with the auxiliaries as well. Right? So auxiliaries aren't going to be trying to produce things, and they're not going to be trying to rule because they're moderate. But it's less important there because they're not on the extremes. Right? They're not the extreme of the city. The auxiliaries are simply and completely serving the city as a whole under the orders of the guardians and supplied by the producers. They're the middle bit. It's hard for the middle to be immoderate. Right? This, this, this idea we have now of, of like a radical centrist would never have occurred to Plato. Again, at risk of, being, of using too political a terminology. OK, what about justice? Where's justice? Yeah. Whole thing. Right. How so? Everything all right? How so? Mm -hmm. um, that everyone understands their job and their role to play. Like, this is not like the teamwork element of it, that they are doing justice to others by cooperating with the system. Yeah, so they're working within the system. They're working as part of this harmonious city. They're doing their part. Right? So if you, if you want to think of justice and moderation kind of in tandem, moderation is not doing someone else's job. Justice is doing your job. What's that? And doing it well. And doing it well, right. Not, um, not in a sense, so not stealing from other people the result of your labor actually doing the thing that you ought to do so that it will provide for the city as it ought to. Provide for the people you're actually providing it for. I use more or less producery examples because it's the easiest to consider in terms of justice. But the same can apply to, uh, to auxiliaries. Um, an auxiliary would be unjust to run away from battle. Not just cowardly, so not just uncourageous, but they would be unjust because they're not providing for their role, right? They're not defending the city like they should. Um, a ruler would be unjust if they were to rule for their own advantage instead of for the advantage of the city as a whole, right? So if they're doing their job poorly or they're simply not doing what they ought to do, then they're being unjust. Now, that can also include all of the things that we ordinarily think of as part of justice. Right? That includes things like giving to each what's owed to them, right? giving to each their due. Right? So if you owe something to someone, that's part of your overall civic duty. Right? That's part of your obligation to the community is to give to people what you owe them. Um, fair trade. Right? So if, you're, if, you're, if you agree to uh, provide a good for someone in exchange for money and they pay you and you don't provide or you provide something substandard, that's unjust. We think of it as such, right? We think of that as something like breach of contract. That qualifies as part of this. But this is overall a broader category, right? So it's not just justice in the sense of, uh, of fair exchange or giving to people what they're owed, specifically, but living harmoniously within a society, with it as part of of a larger community or a larger community. <coughs> okay. And how that means that the whole city is justice is everything is working together for the same common purpose of the good of the whole city. And this is where we get this, I, I mentioned this a while ago, um, the justice in the broader sense of justice being a name for virtue or goodness in general. The Greek word dikaiosune is is what you can what you can uh, translate as justice, or you can also translate it as morality. You can translate it as goodness, or uh, if you're feeling King Jamesy, you can translate it as righteousness. Right. But this is what the broader sense of justice means. It's it's all of virtue working together right, into a cohesive whole. 
Questions on that side? Yes? What if someone was incapable of doing anything? Anything? Like, not, not like let's say like they have like an illness that they pro like okay. prevent them from. Well, well, so remember what we were talking about what the purpose of medicine is. We're talking about this in the end of three. So it's to live. And to live, part of what it is to live is to fulfill your purpose, fulfill your function, is to live well. So if someone's incapable of doing anything, anything, um, well, in a sense, I, I don't want to say, say that strongly, right? So, so Plato would say something like, they should be allowed to die peacefully right, within, this happy, within this happy and harmonious society. Since they're not serving a role and they're not able to serve any kind of a role, then their life would be a burden, not just on other people, but even on themselves. They would be, they would be able to do nothing but be taken care of, which, which isn't fitting properly into a role of society. So, maybe we agree with this, maybe we don't. I'm just putting forward what, what, what Plato's view on the subject would be, right? So, now, again, the likelihood of someone unable to contribute anything whatsoever is very small. If someone is severely injured or, se or severely disabled, they're still probably likely to contribute something. Um, and they're probably, pro they're probably well suited to contribute to something, and then they should do that. Um, and then their treatment should be in allowing them to live that life as fully as they can. So that's the kind of soft-edged version, right? that, that the likelihood of somebody being completely incapable of providing for anything is very small. Um, and if it is, then they're, they're essentially not, not living a life anymore. Now, this isn't to say we should just you know, kill them or starve them to death. But they should be, you know, if they're terminal, they should be allowed to die gracefully and, and peacefully and you know, within the harmony of the city. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. But. Is it kind of like you're born into the group, or is it like you go through school or whatever, and then you figure out? Yeah, that's, that's ambiguous. Plato, uh, dialogue. Um, it's implied that so how it seems to work. Right? It's not too. It doesn't get too much detail on this. But how it seems to work is you're born into a group, right? You're born with a certain nature. You're cert you're you're good at something from the start, from the outset. But it may take time to figure that out. Right? So the guardian's job is to to help figure that out. So however long it takes them to figure it out is the sooner you can get towards that path. Like, I'm just thinking, like, what if someone, let's say, like, born, for like, lack of a better word, a good producer, and like, mm -hmm. they're not good at that, like, they'd be better off at, like, doing it socially or something? That would, I think, be a fault in the wisdom of the guardians, right? Because then the guardians aren't able to determine what they would really be good at. Mm -hmm. um, because if you think someone's going to be a good producer, but it turns out, really, they would have been a good guardian if only they had had the education, well, it's the job of the guardians to make sure that they would have gotten that education. And somewhere they fit, right? So it's not the the would-be guardian's fault. But again, remember, we're assuming that they're perfect at their jobs, they're perfect at their jobs, and they're perfect at their jobs. So, so hypothetically, if this is the ideal city, it wouldn't happen. But if it does, then it's a fault here. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, if someone was born in, into like uh, the producer mm -hmm. area, and they want, um, so they're not allowed to move to outside that. No. Um, why do you ask? Time? I don't think so. Why, why do you ask? Uh, because, I mean, uh, like she said, that, that if someone is not good at being a producer, then it's better off being a, being a guardian and not being like a. Like, so, like, like you said, like a wise and like a counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, if, it's, if it's a matter of mistakes, then you can rule it out, right? Because, again, remember, this is all hypothetical. So we're, we're assuming that these people are perfectly good at figuring it out. Okay. Right? So, if it's a matter of someone thought that they would be a good blacksmith, and it turns out, really, they would be a good soldier. And they, they turn out to be a bad blacksmith. Right? That was the fault of whoever put them in the job in the first place. Right? Yeah, but since they're all interdependent, and they all 
fit into the system, they all buy into it, they drink Kool Aid, whatever. <laughs> if, if someone's born as a producer, they wouldn't want to not be a producer anymore. They would only want to be a producer. Right. So that unless they unless they were wise enough to know that they're not as good at it as they should be, right. in which case it would wouldn't be, be a good they wouldn't be a particularly good producer either either because they think they're wiser than the guardians, which is another problem. Breaks the whole system. Right. So any note note this for later. Any tiny crack in the system shatters it. Note that for later. Yeah. Because if like a person that was born and then the guardians saw mm -hmm. that they had that aptitude to be all three, which one would the guardians let them into? Uh, the guardians, presumably, because it's the most important. Um, unless they would be so outstandingly good at one of the others that it would be better to put them there. So it seems that if someone is capable of doing a higher job, they should be doing the higher job. Um, though it also comes down to things, we, we men I mentioned this earlier a while ago, things like comparative advantage. Right? So if you're good at being a guardian, but really good at being a producer, better than the other producers, well, maybe you should still be a guardian if that's more needed. There aren't other guardians that there need to be. Um, or if you're, even if you'd be a good guardian, but you'd be a phenomenal producer and there aren't producers, maybe you'd be better, at, better suited for producing. It's an individual call in that case. Okay, any other questions on, on the on the, Calipolis, the political side? So if we're decided at a certain age, like not specifically, right? So again, so Plato's not. Yeah, uh, presumably it's at some stage throughout education, right? While they're being educated early on, this this poetry and music um, stage of education, um, how well they take to what parts of it, um, how well they take to physical training and what kinds, and then also a lot a lot of like who their parents were. Presumably they're going to be assumed to be what their parents were, unless, unless there's reason to think otherwise. Right? But there isn't, you're right, there isn't like a specific, you know, at age eight everyone gets to sign their jobs here. Uh, as, much as, that's, as much as that's fairly uh, meant to be a parallel of, of, of the kind of platonic dystopia, right? there's still, um, there's almost shockingly little detail as to how any of this actually works or actually would work. Um, it's just sort of assumed that the guardians are the ones who are really good at figuring out who does what. And they, they figure out who does what and they tell people that you know, you're gonna be best at this and the people who are, who are assigned those jobs are like, oh, thank you, that sounds like a good job. I will do that job. It's kind right. of like knowing if the chicken is male or female. That kind of thing. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> now, maybe they have criteria for figuring it out, right? Maybe they do. Maybe they really do have like ASFAB testing for for, <laughs> for toddlers, guardians. Um, but but again, maybe they don't. But that that would be the expertise of the guardians. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting though because the guardians can only teach what guardians know, and but they would have to employ auxiliaries and producers to function as kind of like pseudo teacher guardians. In order Something to like kind of gauge, well, so gauging whether so gauging whether somebody's going to be a good producer or not isn't the same as knowing how to produce. Mm -hmm. And everyone is going to be like, having this early education of music and poetry, um, and then presumably physical training as well. So it's sometime throughout that process where the guardians identify, hey, you're a potential guardian, or hey, you're a potential auxiliary, or hey, you're a potential producer. Don't blow it. What? Don't blow it. Well, right. Yeah. But if they're just, they won't. They won't, right? They're going to be good at their job. They're going to become good at their job because they're going to get. They're going to be sort of slotted into the correct further education, learning how to produce, or learning how to be a soldier, or learning how to be a guardian. Um, so basically, except for like the age aspect of it, can we think of it like the Joker? Maybe. Um, yeah. So. No, that, that happens too. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, yeah, it does. It does all collapse. Don't worry. Um, that that's the fun part. Um, that's when we get to talk about like Roman emperors and it's great. Um, saving that for another day. Um, so yeah, thinking of it like that isn't. That's actually pretty fair. Now I will caution you though to remember that again. This part, although yes, it's ostensibly about the perfect city. One, he knows you can't institute it. 
try to say as an error. Right? It's a thought experiment. Right? It's all up here. And it's all for the sake of what's on the other side. Yeah. So has he, was this before or after he actually had his um, city? So probably after. Okay. Probably after. Uh, either that or it was revised after because Socrates every once in a while will say will say things like, oh, of course you can't implement this. That's stupid. Right? Uh, it seems like this was after because if he had included all of that in there, it seems like he would have known better. Or maybe he was just incredibly arrogant, which you do get the impression from Plato. Uh, do you know why it didn't work? Like, do people know why? Um, not specifically. Um, it had to do with resource problems, I think. Like allocation of resources, things, and then and then like uh, social dis social disorder, and it got destabilized and fell apart, kind of thing. Um, just people. Yeah. Well, basically, yeah, that's part of it, right? You're trying to instantiate perfection, you can't. You're trying to instantiate perfection on imperfect people; it's going to be even worse. So that's part of it. And then you know the faults that he identifies later on. These little cracks that then make the whole thing shatter. Which he thinks that this, even if it's perfect, will inevitably collapse in at most five generations. Hmm. Well, it might stay perfect for a little while, but as soon as it starts downhill, five generations tops. We'll see why. We'll take a look at this, and we'll see like the specific process of, of how this shatters, because it mirrors the collapse of the perfect soul, or the or the different kinds of disordered souls, disordered people. Okay, so other side, the just soul. Okay, so the just soul, just like the just city, has three parts. What are they? I mentioned this at the end of Tuesday. The rational. Mm -hmm. So we have reason. Okay. That's the equivalent of the guardians. Now, what's the, the equivalent of the auxiliaries? Spirit. Spirit. Okay, now what's the equivalent of the producers? Appetite. Appetite oh. or desires. Now you can substitute here uh, spirit, you can also call passion, you can call it, uh, some translations even refer to it as uh, righteous indignation or righteous anger. Um, it fits. It's the part of you that defends from threats. And then reason, um, reason, uh, I don't think there's any other term for it really. Right? Reason of the rational part of the soul. Okay, so. What does reason, well, start from the bottom up like we did last time. What does appetite provide? What do appetites provide? Like desires and what's, yeah. Your, your needs and wants. Yeah, material needs and wants. <coughs> All right, anybody hungry? Okay. You're right. Um, okay, what is that telling you? I, I, I'll give you a second. What is that telling you? Okay, great. What happens when you eat? You feel good, you feel full, you're, you're, you take in nutrients, the things you need to survive. Um, anybody want a new car? Okay, what is that telling you? What is that desire for a new car telling you? Could be good if you had it. What would getting it give you? Satisfaction, pleasure, um, certain abilities that you wouldn't otherwise have. Maybe you don't necessarily need right now in a certain context, right? Maybe you already have a car, maybe you've got a good friend who has a car. Um, so you don't necessarily need a new car, but it sure be nice. That's your appetites or your desires, recognizing there would be something good about getting this. And so, your appetites, your desires, your wants, and your needs are telling you, get this thing. They're telling you, um, I'm hungry, is telling you, eat food, because you need it. 
So it's providing for your material needs in the case of food or your material wants in the case of a new car or whatever. And it also allows you to accumulate things. How many of you have money? Not all of us, that's, that's fair. Um, right? That means you've accumulated it. Right? You have, you've gotten things that you wanted and you have the capability of getting new things. Same, same kind of thing as, uh, as accumulating other things you might need, that need in order to get something. So accumulating other instrumental goods. So these are instruments of desire satisfaction, things that you would, things that you acquire in order to get them. So that's what appetites in general get you. They get you material. Yeah. I was gonna ask, does that include like non-material desires? What do you mean? Depends what you mean. Like love or like goals. Depends what you mean. Uh, I'm gonna I'm probably just gonna keep saying that, so I'll try and I'll try and explain as best I can. Hopefully because like people desire like stuff like love and like passion yeah, for so, other, so like I so like appetite is more than just material. So it depends on what you mean by love, first of all, because there's a certain kind of love that does fall under appetite, there's a certain kind that does fall under spirit, and there's a certain kind that does fall under reason. Um, of course, because I'll also say, like, love is the second most ambiguous term in the English language. Well, like, I was just saying, like, just love, we, first person plural pronoun. <laughs> For example, the following, in the following sentence, what does we mean? Um, we voted for Donald Trump, therefore we should support our president. Three instances of the first person plural pronoun, three different meanings. I'll just leave that there. Right? Uh, love, is, love is almost as bad. Right? Love is almost as bad. It means three different things in Greek, three and a half different things in Greek. Uh, two or three more in Latin, depending on where you, how you translate things, uh, that are completely different concepts from the Greek concept, by the way. Um, and then any imported uses from any of the other languages that English is beaten up and stolen from. And it's incredibly ambiguous. So really, in that case, it depends what you mean. Um, so love in the sense of, of you know, carnal satisfaction, so to speak. Um, either sexual or companionship or whatever, that kind of thing, that would be appetite, right? Because that would be, in a sense, physical. You want something particular, material, here. Spirit would be something like the, the, part, of, the part of love that spirit wants uh, is a kind of being admired. Right? So being admired by someone who's important to you. You call that love, but that's, part of, that's not necessarily something that belongs to appetite. Companionship in general, right? Someone to share, uh, to share important things with, another person to to treat as. So Aristotle calls it to treat as another self. That's desired by reason, not desired per se, but sought after by reason. We call that love as well. That, now there are other cases that are a lot less ambiguous that are sort of immaterial goods. Honor. Is one. Yeah, it was just Honor like, and reputation. Love was just like an example spirit. of like yeah. something that came with time. But. Worst example you could have chosen. <laughs> Although, admittedly, <laughs> it's a useful example because you can show that there are different parts of it that belong to different parts of the soul. Mm -hmm. But something like ambition wouldn't exist in this kind of. Oh, it would, but it would be. So it would be spirit. Spirit? Okay. Yeah. But is it self serving, though, ambition? Yeah. Oh, no. There's nothing wrong with something being self serving. All appetites are self-serving. Desires are self-serving. So long as it betters yourself, bettering the city in general, so you can do your job. Right. Okay. It, it, it betters the whole of you, yeah. not just satisfying a particular desire. For instance, now we're getting into, actually, you know, we'll hold off on this, because this is going to come <laughs> up when we talk about moderation. It's a big deal when we talk about moderation. Okay, so what is our, what is our spirit, our spirited part, or our passion provide? Conviction, yeah. What does that allow you? What does that get you? 
beliefs and conviction. Kinds of virtues. Can you move on? Purpose. Purpose. Does it like well, well, actually, no. <laughs> I can see why you would think so. Like, purpose is supposed to come from reason. Yeah. Because to actually do something? Yeah, so doing the right thing, the ability to do something that. I was just going to say, in the book, it doesn't say like spirit is like how to implement the reason. You use the spirit to implement what the logic side of the brain Yeah, so it's implementation of the good, it's the ability to do the good. And especially protection from threats. Yes, yeah, it, it mirrors pretty well. Um, okay. Um, and then also implementing the good. And I actually could add this over here as well, so implementing the good. Uh, or I should say, implementing the orders of the guardians. So it's part of what auxiliaries do, is they, they obey the orders of their superiors. Spirit should do the same thing. It should implement what reason determines to be good, and in so doing, protect the self from outside threats. Especially threats to... So not just physical threats, but also threats to honor, to reputation, to social standing, to insults. There's a reason you get angry when someone insults you. That actually makes sense because they're 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 attempting to harm part of you. Now whether 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 they do or not is in part up to you, right? So if, they, if it's only a matter of pride that they're harming, you can decide not to allow them to harm you, right? So going back to Epictetus. But at the same time, if someone is is insulting you, that could harm the part of you that is your reputation, as other people's perceptions of you, that kind of thing. And so it's natural to want to defend yourself against that. And that's your spirited part, that's, that's your passion saying, I can't allow this to happen. This is wrong, I can't allow it. But it has to know that it's wrong from reason. So what is reason for that? Structure of organization. How do you know? <laughs> but also, you know, it's adding here, knowledge of the good. Now the true guardians provide what the good is for the city and for each part of it as well. But that's part of the organization. Now I make it explicit here, and Plato makes it explicit here, um, because it's more, uh, it's more important to see that part of the organization that reason provides is uh, organization towards the good of the whole. Okay. That's sort of implied, assumed, on the political side. Um, but on the individual side, on the side of the soul, um, he wants to be very explicit because, uh, especially because it's in the context of theoretical reason or uh, theoretical wisdom, um, and then implementation of that, so practical wisdom. So each part is each part of the soul mirrors a part of the city, and so each part of the city sort of stands for a part of the soul. So this is this, this is the allegory we've been trying to talk about the whole time. Right? This is why he's been talking about the just city. Is so he can out he can use it as an outline to give the structure of a just person. Okay, so where are our virtues? Where's wisdom? Yeah, so wisdom is in reason. How so? How does wisdom how does the reason or the rational part make the whole self wise? Yeah, so not just theoretical wisdom, so knowing what the good thing is, but then being able to implement it, knowing how best to implement that. And then also, knowing how best to organize your desires. 
so that they all serve the common good, the good of the self. So just like the guardians organize the workers of producers, having them produce the correct things, having the correct people doing the right thing that they are best suited to do, reason organizes the desires and then commands the spirit. And it's wisdom that allows you to do that, to decide, all right, which desires need to be, to be fulfilled, how much? Is this desire oriented towards the right thing? Is this a desire, or is this my honor, or my spirit, or my passion? Determining which is which is part of the wisdom of reason. Okay, what about courage? Where's courage? Spirit. Yes. How so? How does the spirit, or passion, or righteous anger, how does that provide courage for the whole self? How does that make the self as a whole courageous? Maybe mm -hmm. like doing what's right even when you know it's gonna be like uncomfortable. Yeah, so this, the spirited part, the part that gets angry when something goes wrong, that's the part that gets you to do something if it's hard. Right? So you don't want to do something. You don't want to finish, you don't want to finish your paper on time. I want to go to sleep. <laughs> What's reason telling you to do? What is your desire for sleep telling you to do? That's right. How do you decide? That easy, is it? Moderation. Yeah. Right. Maybe. So the desire has to recognize that reason should be in command, okay? But maybe that's not hard. That, that's a little, also a little harder than you think. But how does courage help? You're right. How does, how does courage help there? There's a weird instance of courage, but how does it help? Uh huh. It pushes you through it, even though that you don't want to do it because you want to sleep, you get through it. Yeah. You know what you should do. You know what the right thing to do is. You know what's ultimately. Now, not only what's ultimately the right thing to do in the abstract, but what's going to ultimately fulfill, all of, fulfill most of your desires anyway, what's good for the whole of you is to finish your paper, then go to sleep. Right. You still get to sleep, eventually. You still get to continue sleeping and not lose more sleep as you're trying to make up the class next semester. Right. But reason is telling you, yeah, this is the right thing to do. But without spirit saying, yes, this is what I need to do, I'm going to do it, I'm going to brew that extra pot of coffee and get this damn thing done. Right? If you haven't gone through this, you haven't been in college long enough. If you have gone through this, try not to do it again. Um, right? you, in general, you shouldn't need your, you know, the courage to push through something like this. Right? Your desires ordinarily shouldn't conflict this strongly. But if they do, you need courage. You need to be courageous enough to say, yeah, this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. It's going to suck. I don't care. Okay. All right, now, the next one we were already talking about. What about moderation? What's moderation? Is it yeah. Between these. How is it between the two? It seems like moderation is just tempering desires. No, I shouldn't sleep right now. That would be immoderate of me to sleep anymore. Shouldn't have another cup of coffee. I shouldn't have the extra piece of cake or donut or whatever. Right? That seems like being immoderate. How does reason fit with this? Mm -hmm. so you're, you're reasoning whether or not it's actually a material need or if it's something that you want, something you can do with that or something you have to have. Right. Now, keep in mind, wants are still appetites. And material wants are still things we should seek to fulfill as long as it doesn't disrupt the whole. It's still a good thing to have. Right? Mm -hmm. So would you like moderate your, your reason if you knew that it was going to be more detrimental than Falling with your reason? Yeah, so so here's one. A paper example. Say um, say your paper is due in class 3.30. It's 6 a.m. You're not done. 
let's be let's be reasonable. It's three thirty a.m. It's my dog. Um, reason tells you finish the paper. Desire for sleep tells you take a nap. What do you do? <laughs> Are you sure? Now we have a conflict, right? If reason, yeah. I'll take to a, you can fit both. Yeah. Right? Not at the same time, I don't advise you. No, but, you can, no, but yeah. take a nap for 15 minutes, set an alarm, wake up, finish the paper. You ain't waking up. 15 minutes, you ain't waking up. If you have to take a nap, if you have to, if you have to sleep for five or six hours, well, you can. Dangerous, you can do it. It just depends on how, it depends. So reason still has to be in control, right? Reason still has to say, I need to make sure I have enough time to finish this. But it shouldn't just ignore the desire. Right? That's like the guardian being tyrannical and saying, no, stop producing all of these shoes. We don't need shoes, even though we're you know, marching across the Alps. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it depends on how much work you have left to do. It does. Depends on how much time you need. Depends on how much time you have. Depends on how sleep deprived you are. Mm -hmm. It depends on the quality of your output. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So if you know you're going to write a shitty paper, don't write it. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Email me begging for an extra few hours. You never know. I might be nice that day. <laughs> Probably not. But you never know. <laughs> it might be worth your time. You know, as a last resort kind of thing. But, you know, don't depend on me saying yes. Um, or being awake at 3 a.m. for that matter. You're going to be, though. That's Dude. true. Oh, That's yeah. true. Yeah, I am. Um, but I probably won't be checking my email. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we'll see. Don't bank on it. So my point. So my point is right. Right. So moderation involves both reason knowing its place and desire knowing its place. So desire isn't going to be going to excess. Desire isn't going to say, yes, that whole pizza and the whole cake. Oh, God. Right. Which you, okay, there's another example. Everyone, is anyone familiar with uh, Koizy? Uh, yes. I take leave most of you have been there. Have you ever left without hating yourself? No. You didn't get your money's worth if you don't hate yourself. Now I agree. Yeah. <laughs> But I always hate myself. We see the. Oh, okay. Well. Oh, oh God. Get some help. Get some help. Um, in any case, right? So the point is, though, right? You don't know what Koi is? It's, it's an endless sushi and hibachi place on Brickey House. Check it out. It's great. Um, it's like, it's like what is it, nine ninety nine for lunch? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, right? The point is, yes, you want to order more every time you finish your plate. Regardless of whether you're full or not, you want to have more to eat. Your mind is telling you, oh God, please stop, I'm going to die. But your stomach is like, yeah, this, this is awful, but worth it. Even though it's not, it's clearly not worth it. You feel like hell for like the rest of the day. Um, the point, though, is so, so desire going to excess, appetite going to excess. That's being immoderate. At the same time, reason saying, man, I shouldn't go to Koizy at all because I, I always eat too much. Maybe if you have a legitimate like addiction problem, that might be the solution. <laughs> My strange addiction. Well, yeah, if Koizy is your heroin, maybe avoid it. But, <laughs> Under most ordinary circumstances, right, you can you can behave moderately. Reason saying no, don't indulge at all, is just is being just as immoderate as eating too much. Saying, right, I should not do this thing that I enjoy whatsoever, um, even though it isn't detrimental to me. But just because, well, that's it's just something I want. I don't need it. That's reason being oppressive. Just like the guardians would be oppressive if they were telling workers how to do their jobs or not to do their jobs. 
So can you explain that again, what moderation yeah. does? So moderation is, is, we have this idea of, of moderation as, as the mean between excess and deficiency. Right. So excess is when the appetites get carried away. And they say, I should rule. Right. The appetite should get to decide what I do. I want more sushi, I'm gonna order more sushi. <laughs> Reason be damned. <laughs> On the other hand, the, the deficiency side of moderation is reason saying, oh, this is just a desire, I don't need to fulfill it. Sure, it, it might give me some something good from it, but I don't need it. I can suffice perfectly fine on bread and water. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, but... First of all, not long term. You're crushing your desires. You're crushing the things that you, you that give you the things that you need. But then also, they're not providing for you the things that you want to have. And you do legitimately want to have them, and they would be legitimately good things to have to a certain degree. So moderation is knowing what that degree is. So it's not reason going to excess and saying, I should do exactly this and no more simply because I'm ignoring desire. And it's also not, uh, so, uh, and moderation is also the opposite. It's opposed to desire getting carried away and deciding what to do. So it's reason listening to appetite and appetite listening to reason. Last, you know, like wisdom, courage, and then there's nothing further. Oh, wisdom, courage, moderation, and what's the last one? Justice. justice. Where's justice? All the, All the, the whole thing. <laughs> okay, how does justice in the soul work? If in the city it's every part doing its job well, and every part working together for the good of the city as a whole, what is justice in the individual soul? What do you mean? Like, not um, minding your own business and not like, trying to do something else. That's partially, that's more like moderation, but not infringing on what other people are trying to do. Maybe, uh, like, finding like, a perfect balance between everything to like, fulfill your purpose. All right, so it's a balance that really has a lot to do with fulfilling your purpose. Yeah, but like, like, so using the tools, each part of your soul, to like, fulfill your purpose. But, like, yeah, so. Yeah. Reason doing its job properly, spirit doing its job properly, appetite doing its job properly, and all of them working towards the same goal, the good of the self as a whole, and the self fulfilling its function as a whole. Because right. remember, these, these souls, these people, are nested within a society. Every person in a society has a, full, has a role, has a function, has something to fulfill. Right. So part of justice is fulfilling that role and doing it well. Now, how do you do that? Well, each part of you has to be harmonious with the other parts. It has to be working together doing its proper job with the other parts. So there's two parts of individual justice, and they're equally important, and they can't exist without the other. One is each part working together, playing its role well. The other part is the whole self acting for the good the overall good. So each part has to do its job well, has to act towards the good of the individual, and the individual has to be ordered towards some good end, some overall good end. All that's determined, you figure out what that end is and what the good is by wisdom, so reason figures it out, spirit enforces it, appetites get you there. So you need each part of it, you need all the other virtues, but all of this together is justice in the individual. Okay. Questions? Yeah. I, I think I found the flaw in this. Okay. <laughs> Entirely possible. So you said the reason and the appetite mm -hmm. is moderation. Yep. If, the, if the wisdom affects the moderation 
and the people were turned on the spirit and the reason. Like, for example, if the if this um wisdom were like, all right, you should instead of being such and such, you should be something else, and that person's like, I don't want to be that. Then they'll turn on the wisdom, and then the courage will have to step in, and then it'll like rebellion. Yeah, basically. yeah, exactly. Though that's that's so you you've discovered which I mean this really is the flaw, right? You're right, but it's the same flaw as with the political part. Any little crack is going to shatter the whole thing. Um, this is what's generally this is what's generally referred to as the unity of the virtues. Thesis, which is, in order to have one virtue fully, you need to have all of the others as well. Without all of the others, one isn't going to work. Right? So you can't be fully just if you're not also wise. You can't even be moderate if you're not wise. You can't be wise if you're not courageous, because then appetites are just going to take over your wisdom. You can't be moderate if you're not I already said moderate if not wise, but because then you won't know what the, what the overall good is. You won't know what each of the desires are for. So then they're going to get out of order. Right? They're going to become immoderate. So you need each of the desires, or sorry, each of the virtues. And they all need to cooperate. So without each one of them, all the others collapse. Right? So if something goes wrong with reason, then you're very quickly going to become immoderate, you're going to become uh, cowardly, and you're going to become unjust. If you start becoming unjust, if you start pursuing the wrong ends, or if your uh, if your sort of internal harmony starts diverging, you're soon going to become cowardly, you're going to become unwise, and you're going to become immoderate. So if one of them starts to fall apart, then the rest of them will follow. This is a fairly controversial thesis. This is fairly controversial. Plato thinks this is completely true, that you need all of the virtues to have any of them. There's problems with this. One, how do you get any of them? You have to get all of them at the same time to their maximal degree. That seems to be a problem. It is a problem. Now, maybe you can gradually gain all of them until hopefully, maybe, eventually, probably not, you're fully virtuous. <laughs> Again, Plato doesn't think that most people can be fully virtuous. You have to maintain it. And then you have to maintain it. If there's a fault in one, the rest are going to go away too. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there is no perfect city. You can't make a that's perfect what, that's just city. If we have one, then we will have one now, but we don't. Yeah. Same goes for a person, though. Right? You can't have a fully virtuous person. Just for the same reason you can't have a fully virtuous city. The parts aren't going to always work perfectly well together. And that's how basically the city falls apart, because no yeah. one has the same. Or maybe you do, right. or maybe you do, but for a very limited period of time, right? Someone can be fully virtuous, but there's a very good chance they're going to fall to vice. Right? Because if one if one part crumbles, the whole thing follows. Yeah. I was going to say, since it's hard to have, like, since you say that you can't have one without having them all, mm -hmm. would would it ever be referenced that they like develop in the basic, like, the psychological order? Because you have your wants, technically, I guess, first. Yeah, and generally yes, right? So I don't know a lot about developmental psychology. Yeah. From, what, from what I do, right? So you, it starts with desiring things. Yeah. And then you start to develop indignation, you mm -hmm. start to develop passions, then reason kind of comes over. And so it seems like you would have to develop wants first and then not have any virtues. But when they'd start talking about this, they would, you would assume they'd just skip over that whole, like, I guess, like growing up? Yeah, so. Plato and his student Aristotle don't think you can be even remotely virtuous until you're an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, wherever you put adulthood, it's kind of ambiguous as well. Um, it's somewhere in between like 12 and 60. Um, <laughs> Aristotle didn't think you could be virtuous until you were roughly 60. Then you can retire. And be virtuous. Right. Um, right. So, but the idea is, right, so if any part of it starts to falter, the thing is going to. And that provides a problem for being in, being virtuous and maintaining virtue. And it's also a problem for developing it, right? Especially if we develop these capacities one by one. Because, okay, you need to be, you develop appetite, then you develop spirit, then you develop reason. 
you can't have any of the virtues until you have all, all of those capacities. And then developing all of those capacities without virtue, that's difficult. So maybe there do need to be some corrections to this. So, or maybe we need to understand these virtues as admitting of degree. Right? You become more wise or you become more courageous. But then that's a careful process, because if you're becoming more courageous, it means you're not fully courageous. So it's easy to slip back down. And that's why, I think, this is a large part of why Plato focuses so much and so carefully on the education process. Because building virtue, he understands, is not just teaching, here's how to be virtuous, here, go do it. it it's it's training up your appetites, training up your passions, and training up your reason so that once they're all there and all working together, they can work together properly and virtuously. Anything else? Yeah. So is this Socrates' um, argument or like his definition of why justice is intrinsic as well as instrumental? It's part of it. Part of it? Yeah, this is the basis of it. He gets, he gets, he develops it further. But this is a start, right? <coughs> because you can say that justice is the, sort of the culmination of virtue, so it has to be an end in itself. So all the, the other virtues are for the sake of justice, and justice is for the sake of the other virtues. So being interdependent like that, they each have to be an intrinsic good. So that's part of the argument. Because they, because they depend on each other, they have to then be each intrinsic. So in order for the other three virtues to be for the sake of justice, justice has to be for its own sake, in addition to being for the sake of each of the others. Same applies to each. But it goes further than this, right? And he, he winds up saying that you can't... I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but he eventually winds up arguing effectively that, um, effectively, I think, that you can't be happy, you can't, li you can't live in the proper sense can't live a fulfilling life unless you're just. So you really would pick the just but unfortunate life rather than the fortunate unjust life. That the cloud can set up in test cases. We're not there yet. We don't have everything we need. We need to watch this thing decline and we need a little bit more detail um, to what this looks like and how it develops. But that's the direction he's going. 